Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining this event in the American Inspiration Author Series presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking at the American West, particularly Montana, its families and traditions. I'm Margaret Talkett, the producer of literary programs at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, and part of its Brew Family Learning Center. On your screen is the schedule for our hour long event featuring John N. McLean and his recently published book, Home Waters, a chronicle of a family and a river. Following a brief illustrated presentation, John will be joined by O. Allen Welting, a fellow writer and a Montanan. I'll share their full credentials in a moment, but for now, just a few housekeeping items. We're in a Zoom webinar format, which means that your microphone is muted and your video is off. While we cannot take your comments over the chat button at the bottom of your screen, we will use this space to share some relevant information. We asked for your questions for the author as you registered, but if you have additional queries, please enter them into the Q&A button and we'll try to slip in a few more. Tonight's program is being recorded by my colleagues here at the Brew Family Learning Center. The video of tonight will be published in the days ahead on the American Inspiration website and also on our education pages. We're gonna share that link in the chat and we're gonna Zoom email it to you as well when the video is posted. So if you have friends that weren't able to make it tonight, you're gonna to be able to share it with them. That email is also going to include the list of links and resources that we're sharing in the chat this evening. So do keep an eye out for that. Of course, the real pleasure comes from reading John's beautiful book, which is rich with history and illustrations. Copies of Home Waters can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Mass. You'll see on the screen their coupon code, AMINSP20 which is also being placed in the chat. If you use the code as you order online, they will waive the shipping fee for media mail. Even better than that, use the code and the book you receive will be signed by the author on a book plate. Home Waters is perfect for those who love fly fishing or Montana, its natural riches and history. It's also for chroniclers of the American West and a great gift for those of us who live vicariously, reading safely at home. I must say that John just told us that it went into a fourth printing. So you're gonna want this book um, before that fourth printing sells out. Um, moving quickly to start, uh, you see on your screen biographical information uh, for one of our tonight's presenters. John N. McLean is an award-winning author and journalist. He spent 30 years at the Chicago Tribune, most of that time as a Washington correspondent. After leaving the Tribune, John wrote five nonfiction books about wildland fire, books that are considered a staple of fire literature. They are so accurate and instructive. They are also used as training materials for firefighters. John is the son of Norman McLean, author of the Pulitzer Prize nominated novella, A River Runs Through It, which was adapted for the screen, as so many of us know, by Robert Redford. Our moderator this evening, O. Allen Weltzine, is Professor Emeritus at the University of Montana Western and editor of the Norman McLean Reader. Allen's 2008 memoir, A Father and an Island, tells his family story centered on a Puget Sound island and a saltwater beach. His biography of Montana novelist Thomas Savage was published in 2020. A poet as well, Alan has published two chapbooks and two full-length collections. His works are available through Foothills Publishing. We'll meet Alan soon enough, but for now, John, welcome to you. I loved your book. I loved your tales of early Montana, your ancestors, you know, all the way back to Scotland. It was so interesting how they came through Quebec. Uh, coming from a family of fly fishermen and fly fisher women, I must say that your fishing passages are true genius. We all had a lot to learn. So John, a hearty welcome to you um, and over to you. We can't wait to hear from you. 
Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, Margaret. And uh, it really is a pleasure to be here uh, and to have, uh, have all of you for company. Uh, if you'll notice, I'm smiling. Uh, for me, Home Waters has been an unusual experience. Uh, I've written five previous books about fatal wildland fires. And when I get up in front of people uh, to give a talk, I'm usually not smiling. Uh, it's a little grim. So I've had to evolve uh, into Home Waters, which is basically uh, a positive uh, book about family. Uh, and I hope a positive book about the future of the Blackfoot River. Uh, it didn't start out as a book. Uh, it started out as a fish story. Uh, I tied into uh, the biggest rainbow I've ever seen on the Blackfoot River one time when I was fishing with an old friend of mine uh, on perhaps the most famous hole on the Blackfoot River, the Muchmore Hole. It's the one place on the Blackfoot River that can be positively identified uh, as being in a scene in a river runs through it in my dad's book. Uh, it didn't happen too many years ago. Uh, so this is a fairly contemporary story. And I got in a big wrestling match with this fish uh, and, and with my fishing partner uh, participating. Uh, he had a great big two-handled net and he kept trying to uh, net the fish and the fish didn't want to cooperate. And it was too big for one thing, uh, even for a net that size. And it wound up being half in and half out. And by banging the fish with the net uh, and tussling around with them, I was got to be uh, at a point pretty sure I was going to lose the fish. Uh, and to me, it was, it was kind of sickening because uh, it would have been the fish of a lifetime. Well, the battle ended and uh, my friend uh, a few days later asked me to write the story of it uh, for a small fishing uh, club that he belongs to in Chicago, just for their journal. And so I thought, well, why not? It was a dramatic story. So I sat down and wrote it and uh, put it aside and told the story to some friends. And I said, you know, that's a good Montana story, you know, the hook to the much more hole uh, and the big rainbow. And uh, it was the fish of a lifetime and you faced the prospect of losing them. Why don't you write that for Big Sky Magazine? So I thought, well, why not? And I did. Uh, a couple of years passed, and an editor from New York was taking a vacation in Livingston, Montana, picked up an old tattered copy of Big Sky Magazine, and there was the story. And he called me up and he said, would you like to do a book about this? And I thought for a while, and I thought, well, you know, it's, it's a fish story. <laughs> not, I'm not sure it's a book. But then I started to realize that it's much more than a fish story. It could be. Uh, it could be a story of uh, my involvement with the same world that my father wrote about in A River Runs Through It. I didn't start out to write a companion book uh, to A River Runs Through It. That is something that developed along the way. What I found with, uh, uh, as I worked on the book, was that I had already done an awful lot of research that fed into a book that became Home Waters. Uh, and I'd done it for decades and decades. Uh, some of it went back to uh, my giving talks when my father was old and could no longer go out and accept uh, wonderful prizes that were given him for having written The River Runs Through It. And I would go out and give a talk. And people wanted to know, what was it like to fish with Norman McLean? because by then he was becoming very famous. And so I would write a talk, a short one, about what it was like to fish with Norman McLean. And then what it was like to fish with our great fishing partner, uh, George Kunenbergs. And I didn't like repeating myself every time, so I would write more anecdotes and throw them in. And I had all those things uh, in files. I hadn't intended to write a book, they weren't saved. Then as I got into the book, uh, I realized that there was a theme uh, there uh, that I was picking up from A River Runs Through It. And it was the murder of my father's brother, my uncle, uh, Paul. And I kind of came upon it by surprise as I wrote the book. 
uh, one day I found I was writing about it, finding an old shirt of Paul's at uh, our cabin at CD Lake when I was a little boy and putting it on. And <laughs> it was like putting on a tent. I mean, Paul was a big guy and I was just a little guy. Paul has been a shadow person for me my entire life. So that became a theme. And then I realized, you know, I got a lot of questions here. A River Runs Through It is a short uh, novella. It's 104 pages. You know, how did we get to Montana? How did my family get there? How did the Blackfoot River get called the Blackfoot? Obviously, it was for the Blackfoot Indians. But when did that happen? Uh, who were the first white guys to come out here? Who were the first people to fish here? And on and on. How'd the fish get here? How'd the rainbow trout get in the Blackfoot River? How did the brown trout get there? So I kept asking myself these questions and doing a little research uh, and finding out answers. Uh, yes, we came from Scotland, but we came from Canada. My grandfather was born in Canada. His parents were born in Canada, in Nova Scotia. Uh, and I discovered there was this school in Nova Scotia, the Pictou Academy, uh, that had nurtured my grandfather. Uh, it was a, started by Presbyterians, by a Presbyterian minister, but it wasn't a theological school. Uh, he would, the guy who started it would teach theology privately, but it was a science school. It was a natural science school. Uh, it stressed what could be stressed at the time uh, about science in the middle of the 19th, late 19th century. And it was so good that John James Audubon stopped there on his way back from a trip to Labrador because the collections there were so fine. And I realized that, you know, there's a real connection here to the opening line of a river runs through it. In my family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. The link between nature uh, and religion uh, was nurtured at the Pick Two Academy. And I had never known that. So I thought, kept finding out a bunch of things like that. Uh, and finally, uh, in the end, um, I had a book. Uh, I had a book with a lot of moving parts. And so the technical challenge of home waters was to make these things segue from one to another in a comprehensible way that didn't uh, knock the reader off the rails. And I thought that if someone were teaching uh, home waters, uh, that it would not be a bad assignment to say to please examine the transitions uh, in home waters, because there are some pretty major ones. I mean, we go back to 1806 and Meriwether Lewis's journey through the Blackfoot Valley. Uh, we go through the, the big fire of 1910. Uh, we come up to modern times and the challenges uh, to the Blackfoot River uh, environmentally. I mean, there's a lot of ground covered here, as well as uh, the undercurrent theme of the family's uh, involvement in all this, and in particular, uh, Paul's murder. Uh, so that's the way the book evolved. And uh, if we want to go to a slide, we can take a look at an inspiring uh, part of the book. Uh, what, one of the things that really inspired the book, and that is the Blackfoot River itself. Uh, it's a pay on to the Blackfoot River. Uh, Blackfoot River has a, a wonderful geology for a fisherman because it basically keeps its shape uh, decade after decade. And that was one of the things I wanted to explore more uh, in my book. Why does it do that? Why, is it, why are these holes that I fished when I was just a little boy uh, still there virtually the way they were uh, for me then? They're there now. They were there that way for my dad. The much more hole hasn't changed from the time he was a young man, which is uh, at the early part of the 20th century. So it's a beautiful river. And uh, it has some problems. Uh, that I explore in the book. My father's book is the fishing book. It ignited a massive interest in fly fishing and in the Blackfoot River. And initially it was very positive. Blackfoot River was in very bad shape when A River Runs Through It came out, the book came out. Uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks had stopped doing fish counts. Uh, the river had been poisoned when a dam at its headwaters broke. 
uh, releasing a flood of cadmium into the waters of the Blackfoot. Uh, ranchers were not fencing it off, and it was basically an open sewer for cattle. Uh, there were a lot of problems with it. Before uh, the movie started, uh, Trout Unlimited uh, had gotten uh, a program started to try to bring it back, but it had a long way to go. Once the movie uh, of A River Runs Through It came out, money poured in. Uh, it came from private sources, but it also came from governmental sources. They would be able to do a restoration project. There'd be government money for that. Uh, it would take forever <laughs> to get it started because they have to have an EIS and they have to have meetings. And they realized, they being these agencies, realized that if they gave the money directly to the private groups that were involved in the conservation effort, Trout Unlimited, uh, the big Blackfoot chapter of Trout Unlimited and the Blackfoot Challenge, that the money could be put to use almost immediately. And millions of dollars was put to use that way through local people to local projects. And the river came back mightily. And I will tell you, even though the problems of today are severe, uh, and I'll describe them in a second, that the fishing is better than I remember when I was a kid. Part of that is that I'm not a kid anymore and I can catch bigger fish. But part of it is that there are more fish in there and it's a healthy fishery again. The problem is that we are loving the Blackfoot to death. Uh, it is grossly overused. There is no responsible movement in the political body in Montana to impose sensible, modest restrictions. A friend of mine told me this year that at one put in on the Blackfoot, you can see it's not that big a river. There were 100 vehicles or rigs, which means that people who had pulled in and dropped off their boat and pulled away were not counted in that 100. That was just the people who were there at the time or the rigs that were there at the time. And the answer uh, of the state authorities has been, well, we need to big a, build a bigger parking lot and we need to put in more camping facilities. Uh, Senator Tester from Montana has a program, uh, an act uh, that's uh, going to be reintroduced, I think this fall uh, to try to do something about this and uh, introduce some compromises. Uh, everybody gets a little, nobody gets everything they want. But the Blackfoot and other rivers in Montana and elsewhere are being pounded today, uh, partly because of the pandemic, but also the underlying current here is a lot more people are fishing, a lot more people have money to get out there on the river. Uh, and it is a major uh, environmental problem. Instead of uh, continuing to ring on that, maybe we ought to get uh, Alan Weltzing in here for a moment and expand our, our talk a little bit. This is, a, well, before we do that, before we let Alan in, I wanna tell a little story about this. This is a beautiful bend in the river. And this is one of the places that's uh, now a put in. And I was down there uh, this June and the place was jammed with, uh, with rigs from one end to the other. We used to go here in the evening, uh, except on weekends and pretty much have the whole place to ourselves. That's not true anymore. I click one more here. You know, it's, it, it's breathtakingly beautiful. Um, and despite uh, whining a little bit about it, uh, you can still get out there and see what it was uh, in the early part of the 19th century. This scene hasn't changed much. Uh, it really hasn't changed much from the time Meriwether Lewis went through the Blackfoot Canyon in 1806. This would be uh, later in the year. Uh, this is early fall. He went through in July, but this is what he would have seen, uh, and it's a compelling sight. Okay, one more. Oh, this is uh, another little theme of the uh, book. I've written five books about fire, and, and my dad wrote Young Men and Fire, which was what got me started on it. Um, this is a photograph of a nice little cutthroat trout. Uh, on one of the tributaries of the Blackfoot, the Landers Fork. And I took this very happily one day. I had been on my way back from Helena to my cabin at Sealy Lake and just stopped to fish for an hour and a half. And I caught about 12 fish 
this size, uh, all on dry flies, all beautiful little cutthroat. And I let this guy go. And then uh, he being very obliging, stayed around so I could take his picture. And two years ago, I went by the Lander's Fork and boy, patting myself on the back, I'm gonna have another wonderful time. I stopped at the same place, got out my rig, fished for two hours and never saw a fish. And what had happened is that in the interim, uh, the Alice Creek fire had burned 60,000 acres in the headwaters of the Lander's Fork. And all the vegetation that had draped over the water and kept it cold uh, and pure had been stripped off by the fire. And <clears throat> the water now was warm uh, and the fish didn't like it as a place to hold. There would be fish going through there, migrating up into the colder, uh, deep headwaters uh, in a wilderness area, but uh, they would not be spending any time in the Lander's Fork. So fire is a troubling commodity. We think that we could uh, control it. That was the idea at the beginning of the 20th century. Man will control fire. And that's not the case. Uh, we've tried to do that. And as you can see from this summer, uh, it has not been a successful operation. Nature is far stronger than we are. Uh, climate change is one of the differences. Bad forest management is another. Uh, you cannot uh, control it. You have to find a way to live with it. Tough, tough duty. Okay, now let's get Alan in. That's not Alan. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hi, John. Uh, Hi, Alan. John has uh, uh, put up with me for uh, 27 years, even though I can uh, barely fish, as he knows. I'm more of a hiker, backpacker, and a, and a lousy climber. But we first met uh, just after John was switching gears, and uh, we were walking in Man Gulch on the 45th anniversary of the Man Gulch fire. And uh, he had made a pretty serious uh, change in his life uh, a month or two before then. And uh, uh, in a way, uh, like his father, he got to a different kind of writing. Uh, and he's uh, in uh, middle age and got, has written more books than his, than his father did. Uh, it's hard for a McLean guy like me to uh, uh, resist all kinds of uh, father-son analogies here. but. Uh, one of the things that uh, that makes uh, home waters uh, outstanding is the uh, language that's provided by the uh, Wesley Bates uh, wood engravings that were uh, created uh, carefully and deliberately for um, for different uh, parts of of the text and. Uh, there's a uh, yet another connection through these uh, wood engravings back to the uh, the book that uh, is the as John has said uh, in the past is, is the earlier companion to Home Waters and that is his father's river runs through it. Now, John, would you a, like to? Uh, I would uh, like to talk about that because that's that was an important uh, element. I said that I didn't set out to write a companion book to A River Runs Through It, and I, I think Home Waters stands on its own. That's all fine. In the course of doing it, I very consciously talked to my editor about the possibility of having wood engravings in home waters similar to the ones in the first edition of A River Runs Through It. Uh, my dad had participated in uh, that artistic effort. He had brought back images, photographs, drawings, whatever, from the West and had given them to an artist at the University of Chicago Press uh, who had created these images. And there's always been a lot of questions about them. You know, are they places in the book? Well, they're really not. They're kind of general images. Uh, what about the one on the cover, which is a big cliff and a river below it? Uh, is, where is that on the Blackfoot? Well, it's not on the Blackfoot. Well, where is it in Montana? Well, it's not in Montana. Well, where is it? And there were lots of these kinds of questions. Yeah. Before I ever got into this book, um, I got in touch with, or a guy got in touch with me who's doing an essay on the illustrations in River Run Through It. He said, I haven't been able to answer any of those questions. Can we find the guy who did them? And we found him in retirement, living in his 80s in uh, Hyde Park. And he answered the questions. 
to solve one mystery, the image on the cover of A River Runs Through It is a composite image of his own imagination. It isn't any place in particular. So then we got my publisher agreed to go along with this idea, which is, by the way, uh, an undertaking in a lot of different ways, uh, one of them financial. And we found this guy, he found this guy, Wesley Bates, who did a marvelous job. It's different in that each of the images that Bates did is tied to the text of Home Waters. This image is the fish. This is the big rainbow. And you saw the photograph of it before. Let me ask you a question, Alan. I thought long and hard about including that actual image of the big rainbow, the photograph, because it's real. And that fish was mythological in a lot of ways. But mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. book, Home mm -hmm. Waters, is, is nonfiction. A River Runs Through It is fiction. It, it's, it's shelved as a fiction book. And so I decided to do it, but I fudged it. <laughs> if you find it in the book, it doesn't say this is the fish in the book. It says this is a fish of great size and power, which is right. the phrase that's used for it. So right. should I have done it? Was I wrong or? I prefer the wood engraving. Although I certainly like that. I, I love the photo too. By the way, one uh, registrant did uh, want to know, uh, was this catch and release, the biggest rainbow you ever caught? Uh, it uh, definitely was. Uh, it took me a long time uh, and a period of evolution to go from catch and eat to catch and release. Uh, but I did it and uh, the, the, I had trouble with this guy. Uh, it was a uh, it was a long, very difficult fight, and he spent a lot of time with his head out of the water. If you want to know how to land a big fish, uh, one of the things you do is get him tired enough that you can get his gills a little bit out of the water, because then you're starving him for oxygen and it slows him down, and you can then get him in and get him released. Yeah. But I didn't. This was unintentional. It was just he was not in good shape, and when I released him in the water, he turned belly up. And that's the way fish die. They can't right themselves if they're exhausted. Sure. So I had to turn him back right side up and mm -hmm. then kind of keep my fingers like that on either side. You know, you don't grab them because you don't want to mess up the mucus on their bodies. Right. But I just kept him upright long enough so that he could uh, recover. Could you say a little bit more about the, John, the um, evolution in the McLean dynasty and fishing the big blackfoot? of the, the change to catch and release. Was that difficult? Was it slow? This was not something the old man uh, 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 favored, I assume. Well, we took a lot of our morality and our techniques from George Krunenberg's. Okay. Uh, and the way my dad described it was, look, you know, we're not out there 12 months out of the year. Our great friend, George Krunenberg's, who was uh, a master fisherman, the master of the Blackfoot. He's out there 12 months out of the year. Mm -hmm. And when there is, is an advance in something like leader, where all of a sudden uh, you're using tapered leaders after having used one size leader, we take George's direction on this. And George, uh, who was you know an enormous guy, he hunted, he fished, he depended on fish uh, to help feed his family. He was the one who said, you know, we're getting into a place now where this is the new approach and we've got to take it seriously because the resource, the fish, uh, are not an inexhaustible resource. And so he was the one who started it and got me into it and in fact chastised me. Uh, I remember one time we went out and he had a rubber boat at the end and uh, liked to row it as much as he liked to fish almost. Mm -hmm. And I was using one of his big flies, great big streamer like that, that I love to call it a Santa Claus fly. And he said, you should uh, let me put the barb down on that. So it's a barbless hook. I mm -hmm. said, oh, come on, you know, you lose fish that way. He says, John, I guarantee you that you will catch just as many fish. And okay. I, did, I didn't do it, but uh, I do now have a whole set of barbless hooks. It was, so it's an evolutionary thing. You have to get used to it. You can't just say one day I'm a meat hunter and the next day I'm God's gift to uh, conservation. Indeed. Yeah. You know, you, uh, I wonder if you can comment any more than you did already about the really tough issue of uh, loving a place to death. Because among other things, home waters uh, is very much a what people like me like to call an essay of place and 
Uh, I've always loved this kind of writing. I prior to produce this myself, my uh, memoir book is uh, uh, is absolutely about the place where I'm sitting right now, as a matter of fact. But this has sort of got a, a literary uh, uh, element to it that's that's difficult, and I'm afraid that uh, it could be I said uh, home waters will only increase people wanting to be on and love the Big Blackfoot River. So, do you think the next step in terms of uh, uh, environmental recovery in this fishery and this river is, uh, frankly, some kind of a rationing system? Because well, my dad was not in a position to speak out on this on the issue of conservation uh, in a way that uh, was broadcast. By the time the movie uh, of the river came, River Runs Through It came out, uh, he was gone. Uh, mm -hmm. But I am in the position where I am here, and I speak of this every time that I speak of the book. Uh, the need for some kind of sensible uh, restriction. I'm not going to prescribe to these people what to do, but there are prescriptions. I mean, as I say, there's a, uh, an act that uh, Senator Tester is going to come out with. Yeah. Uh, I've agreed That's to help COVID. support that, uh, to speak when I can about it, and then to shut up about it when I should shut up, which is I don't want to tell people this acre needs to be saved and that one doesn't, and you know, because I'm spending all my time out there. Leave well, that to it... the people who are spending all their time out there, yeah. but make it clear guys that were overdoing it <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it has gone too far i was as i said i was out there in june yeah. and went down to the river with a actually with a film crew one day and i thought this is great because you're gonna be done in the afternoon and i can hang out on the blackfoot and fish one of my favorite spots in the evening get the evening rise we had to stop the shoot about every five minutes because another boat came through and just <laughs> one after another after another well and when they were finished so was I. I went home. Yeah. I'm not going to do, put up with that. And uh, the uh, viewers from New England might uh, know already that this is a problem with fisheries, rivers all over Western Montana and elsewhere. Certainly the Beaverhead River and the uh, Big Hole River are famous fisheries also uh, in my backyard. And there are similar problems there with uh, uh, to the point that uh, commercial um, uh, folks are restricted. Uh, there are a couple of days uh, a week when they're not supposed to be on the on the Beaverhead River, and that was a state law passed 20 years ago. Well, and it's still a very, Blackfoot, yeah. good law. Yeah, I mean, these are really jammed places. But uh, to change uh, uh, direction a little bit, there have been a lot of audience questions, John. Could you make any other comment about how or why your family ended up from Canada into Western Montana and, and Missoula specifically. Well, I wondered about that too. And, uh, you know, it, it seems that we uh, sprang uh, full blown from the head of Scotland and, <laughs> and it didn't happen that way. Uh, my grandfather was out in uh, Nova Scotia and I, we have a family uh, upper respiratory uh, ailment that gets passed on from one another. And I think that may have been what happened to him, that he had to get out of the maritime climate. He got out to Manitoba, Canada, where it was much drier, and he went to school yep. there uh, right. and uh, discovered this pioneer family uh, who had settled uh, out there, been among the first settlers, Presbyterian family. They were English, the Davidsons. And uh, he uh, courted uh, Clara Davidson, who was 10 years younger than he. They used to go out uh, on the circuit on Sunday in a buggy, and he would preach at different small uh, uh, gatherings of Presbyterians or in that area. Uh, and then he went to school, finished up at school in California, and in fact was a pastor in, uh, in California for a number of years. Then okay. he got a call to, uh, to Bozeman, and that was his first uh, posting uh, in Montana, and he must have uh, he must have loved it. I, he always had this combination of loving the outdoors and loving God. And I've talked to uh, people who would get go to summer school uh, around in Montana with him, with the kids. They were little kids then, and then they grew up uh, and talked to me. And they were almost uh, my contemporaries. And I said, well, when Dr. McLean gave the, the courses uh, in summer school, he would start out talking about a psalm or something like that. He said in five minutes, he was talking about trees and water and skies and mountains. You know, he was onto it real quick.
So then he bounced back to Iowa. He was not, you know, ministers do that. They go from place to place. That's where both the boys were born, Norman and Paul. Right. And then when they were very young, uh, he found out uh, that there was a call for a minister in Missoula. <laughs> and they couldn't get anybody to come out to Missoula. I mean, what? The frontier out there with the Indians and the cowboys? And he was out there like a shot. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's where he stayed the rest of his life. Uh, his, well, there was one uh, further uh, job in Helena, yeah, uh, a big administrative right. job, but Missoula was his home from then on. So it was a kind of a roundabout way, but once he'd found it, once he'd found Montana, uh, he was hooked. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the fish that got hooked. And he certainly passed that on to his kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, another uh, question that came in, John, from the audience, so given your track record with uh, wildfire books that, uh, uh, and I might say that uh, besides the impressive expository load that each of those books has, they're also, uh, you know, uh, to say they're emotionally gripping is an understatement because these are, these are tragedies uh, and uh, they have something of the, uh, uh, what inevitability of a Greek tragedy actually because death is involved and it's when and how it comes. So uh, a couple of at least a couple of folks have wondered uh, if you're going to write any more fire books. So perhaps you can tell the others what you've told some of uh, myself about Yarnell fire, for example. Well, the the big modern fire, tragic fire, is the Yarnell Hill fire. Uh, and I've worked on it with a partner for uh, since it happened in 2013. And it is in hiatus at the moment, obviously, because I'm doing home waters and have been. Uh, I hope to get back to that. But, you know, we were partners for eight years. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and it's not an easy thing to do to step away for a long time and then come back to something that is as heavily uh, and meticulously detailed as that. I would like to finish it. So would my partner. Let's see what what we can do with that. It's an important book. We've got 200 pages into the thing. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And would you remind everyone what the uh, fatality uh, uh, score was on that fire? And yes, the Arnold Hill fire uh, nearly wiped out a hotshot crew, the Granite Mountain hotshots. I killed 19 members of a 20 member crew. Uh, the only one who escaped had been a lookout who went uh, off independently. Uh, they were fighting a, a fire that had started uh, on a late on a Friday. Uh, the fatalities happened uh, late in the afternoon on a Sunday. And frankly, the, the firefighting on it was uh, anything but a, a good example of how to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. They could have gotten it. They should have gotten it on Saturday, and they didn't get it. Yep. Uh, then when they realized that they were losing it on Saturday and started calling for everything that they could think of, which they did, I mean, you know, there was a real effort to try to get stuff in there. It, it arrived uh, too late to have the desired effect. Right. They didn't contain it. And then they were hit with a, uh, a big turnaround of the fire by a weather event, much predicted, in fact, uh, super accurately predicted. And then there were certain breakdowns in communications uh, breakdowns in decision making, uh, all the mistakes that have been made kept adding up one after another after another. You, know, you can get away with a lot of mistakes on a fire. <laughs> I mean, this is not brain surgery. But uh, what I've seen on fire after fire that goes bad is uh, that one mistake is made and it leads to another. And it's just easier to make that second mistake. And then, well, you know, that's the, that's what we're into here. You know, things are happening too slowly and uh, we can only operate at a certain speed, and which is true. And yeah. then it becomes cumulative and then nature takes over. Yeah. And then it does something that you didn't expect. The fire does something that is out of its normal uh, uh, channel. And all of a sudden, you're dead. Uh, and these things happen with great regularity. Much is learned. Uh, things have been learned, especially since Man the years of Man Gulch. The middle yeah. of the 20th century was the beginning of the, the great learning of, of safety procedures. Don't yeah. think that there aren't lots of people in the fire service. 
uh, who worry about this and do everything that they can to see that they don't happen again. Uh, but then they do. Well, you have just, as you know better, you know better than I do. You've just dis, uh, described part of the major texture and effect of young men and fire. And you know, I always think about that line of your father's that the universe is not uh, yet uh, done with blowups. And uh, uh, in some ways, your fire books certainly uh, give uh, a tragic uh, and generous evidence uh, of that too. Uh, maybe we can still have a couple more questions. We've had a question about, John, your, um, your father's um, health in the last, uh, you know, two or three years of his life at that st the stage he was at with the Young Men and Fire manuscript and what you and your sister were going through with your dad there. Could you give any more comment on the the... Oh, I, I, I'd like to handle that as briefly as possible. Okay. Uh, he worked on Young Men on Fire uh, for about 14 years, and uh, it was effective for a while, and at the end, it wasn't effective work. He had a great uh, research partner, Laird Robinson, who was a great friend of yours and mm -hmm. mine, and uh, who is no longer with us. Uh, and Laird made a lot of things possible for him. Uh, in terms of research and to, in terms of getting in and out of the Gulch. Uh, but I used to call my dad uh, when I was in Washington. And I would make the mistake sometimes of calling him in the morning. And uh, he finally said, you know, I'm a writer. <laughs> I'm spending my mornings writing. <laughs> like, why are you interrupting me? And I'd say, well, how's the book going? Uh, and he'd said, well, it's a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Yeah, I remember hearing that line. Yeah, and he just had a terrible problem with it. And what's fair to say about it is that uh, he started out to try to write a book of the kind that I write, which is a straightforward uh, nonfiction narrative. And it, that wasn't his game. Yeah. Uh, and he made a mess of it. And he was told that he'd made a mess of it. Yeah. Uh, including by one of his, by the guy who had, brought a river runs through it to the University of Chicago Press, was an editor there, edited it, uh, yeah. schemed to get it published and succeeded in doing so as a great champion. And he said, you know, this, this book you've written, it isn't any good. And boy, uh, that ended the relationship uh, yeah. right there. But mm -hmm. he took the advice. He could not do that kind of straightforward nonfiction book. What he wrote was high tragedy. That he could do. And believe yeah. me, uh, not many people can bring that one off. Uh, let me see if we uh... and he brought it off. Yes, uh, I... you know, I've, just let's finish up with how this turned out in the end, because we said, you know, you are sitting there and he can't get at me at a bad start on it. In the end, when they, it was published, uh, people tried to grapple with it. Uh, and it was given pri a prize, big prize, and one thing yes, or another. Well. But it is obviously some, there's some rough reading in there. Yeah. And uh, the editor on that book, a guy by the name of Alan Thomas at the UC Press, gave a talk about it. Yes, uh, he did. One time. And he said the conclusion of the talk was Young Men and Fire shows you that you can have a book with great flaws that is a great book. And both my sister Jean and I went up to him, we heard the talk, went up to him and said, you know, you, you better get that published because that's the best analysis that anyone has ever done of that book. And he, he said, okay. And he went to work and he got it published, wound up in the LA Times book review. And that I think is the final bottom line. There's some things in that book that are, are rough reading. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it is a book that, takes fire and raises it to a level of high tragedy. And uh, that's also what happened with uh, In River Runs Through It uh, with Paul. Absolutely. And uh, I wonder if you would be willing to uh, talk a little bit more about your uncle, because that's, that's perhaps the most uh, profound uh, thread or connection between uh, A River Runs Through It and Home Waters. Yes, it is. Uh, my uncle's death and murder in Chicago haunted my father his entire life. Uh, he did not get closure when he wrote A River Runs Through It. It was still with him. Uh, he wished that he could have done something. 
uh, he had offered something of himself to Paul and it was refused repeatedly. And Paul came to a bad end. In A River Runs Through It, he wrestles with this and tries to make Paul's death uh, more meaningful than just a, a sordid event in a back alley on the south side of Chicago late on a Sunday, early on a Monday morning. Uh, and he does that by trying to connect it to, oh, it was his gambling caught up with him. Uh, and he used to say that kind of thing uh, to people that, you know, Paul had gambling debts and uh, got in real trouble and they caught up with him and uh, beat him to death. Uh, well, you know, money collectors don't do that. They don't do it on late on Sunday nights in a black neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Uh, so, as I said, I've had to live with Paul my entire life. They were going to name me Paul. My father was, and thank God my mother talked him out of that. But uh, he has been an, an influence uh, of different kinds uh, through my life. So when I was writing Home Waters, I said, you know, I actually did a lot of work uh, 30, 40 years ago, trying to find out what really happened with his murder. And I did find out and I put it all away and I never intended to do anything with it. I did it for my own satisfaction. But when I was doing Home Waters, I pulled all that stuff out and uh, I put it in, uh, I put in a nice straightforward reporters, police reporter account of how he was killed. And uh, it has had a number of effects on me since then. What is Paul's real legacy? I was trying to turn it into a nonfiction legacy and I did that. But if you look at how that has been transformed since a river runs through it came out, it has become something that I think complements Paul and complements my father and has been good for me to live with. The first thing that happened was, it turns out there are a lot of people like my dad who had a sibling who was trouble, uh, a black sheep of one gender or another. And they offered something to that troubled person that was dear and deep within them. And it was refused and it came to a bad place. And that has haunted these people ever since. And they feel alone and lost and rejected. And by reading River Runs Through It, uh, they felt differently. I know that because I've read the fan mail. And what they say is, we're not alone. Suddenly we realize that you have spoken for a great many of us. And they express comfort from that. The second thing that happened, it wasn't just a straightforward story. This was a story taken to a high eloquent level. And it was the gift of literature to take them up several steps. This is not something that just occurred in a CD back alley in Chicago. This is something that occurred at a high level of tragedy, an elevated level. And I know that that's true over the long term because now I get those kinds of letters. But what I have thought of since, in addition, is two things. One is with no Paul's murder, there would be no A River Runs Through It, Young Men on Fire, any of my five books or Home Waters. And that's on Paul to a degree. It's on the rest of us because we've done the work. But that is part of his personal legacy. Yes. The other thing is that he is a good negative example. <laughs> uh, the movie, the kids love him in the movie. They realize that, you know, he's charming and handsome and Brad Pitt and my God, you know, how can you knock that? And yeah. you don't have to watch his violent end. But the kids know you cannot act the way he did without dire consequences. And that's something I came to know very personally in my life. And it has changed my life that uh, you know, I went into newspapers just as he did. I've become a fisherman just as he did. But there are parts of his behavior uh, that were negative cautions uh, mm -hmm. for me. And I think they are for other people too. So that's why Paul is in there. And I don't apologize for it at all. I'm glad I did it. And it's also to show that you know, dad didn't ever come to total terms with it. Uh, mm -hmm. He believed Paul was still there in a way, uh, very real for him. Uh, he was a hard-nosed skeptic uh, and all that kind of stuff. 
but uh, he had his ghosts and Paul was one. Yeah. Well, thank you for that statement. Uh, I couldn't agree with what you said more, uh, John. And uh, I think now uh, we've had enough questions and uh, we'll turn this over to uh, our uh, friendly producer. We can't hear you, Margaret. You need to unmute. Gosh, so much for a veteran that I am. Very upsetting, sorry. Um, what a great conversation. I, I really enjoyed it uh, about conservation and testers bill. Everybody wants to know if it's gonna work. Um, let's hope so. Uh, and, um, and also to Paul, um, Alan didn't mention it, but there were a lot of questions coming in about Paul. So it's really great that you answered that. And um, I so enjoyed this portrait of the American West. Um, thank you so much, Alan, for being such a great moderator. And wow. thank you, John. And uh, friend, all of you, it was you remarkable. And we love that you're all the way across the country and with us tonight, the great things of Zoom. Um, so as we do for all of our American Inspiration author events, uh, we've asked John to share a reading or some reflection from his book as part of our closing. Um, so please, and he's also going to share another engraving. Um, so Trisha, if you could tee that up, um, a reading from Home Waters and this engraving, uh, John, back to you. I do not fish alone on the Blackfoot River ever, even though now I mostly fish it by myself. When I'm on the water, and especially when no one else is around, I feel the presence of the generations of my family whose stories run through it. Memory can and should be more than a bridge to the past. It's also a way to see yourself as a thread in a broad fabric long in the making. By the time my own sons, Danny and John Fitz, were able to fish the Blackwood River with me, the older generation had been whittled down in number. Nowhere was the spirit we all shared more present though than at the much more whole with its river wide reef and its massive whirlpool covered with foam and links to the past. It had taken me a lifetime to reach this place and to connect with the enormous rainbow trout that had risen in a curving arc a dream fish that now threatened to spit the fly back in my face. My fishing partner, Jay, swiped the net time and time again <clears throat> until finally the fish tired enough to be held half in and half out of the net. Jay gingerly carried both fish and net to shore. We took only a couple of hurried photographs because the fish was exhausted and needed to be back in the water as quickly as possible. When I placed him in the river, he turned belly up fish die that way. I righted him and turned his head upstream into the oxygen-rich water. He thinned to stay in place, his gills panting. A minute passed, maybe more. Finally, he turned and slowly began to move back into the current toward the deep water. And then with a single rippling thrust of his entire body, he shot into the depths and disappeared. I walked over to a big snag lying on the bank up near the high water mark. The river had stripped off the bark and polished the tree trunk to a bone white smoothness. A forked branch stuck up from the snag and I sat on the trunk and leaned back into the branch. I was comfortable there. Strobe like images of a fish's glaring eye and iridescent strip of scarlet and a salmon-sized head flashed in my mind's eye. I'd never seen a Blackfoot rainbow that big before, never. The present moment slowly came back into focus. A turquoise sky, wind stripped of clouds, bright sparkling sunshine, and the endlessly moving river. Life doesn't stop when you reach a peak. It moves on as before, just as a river does after a fight with a big fish. On a day like this though, and after a rainbow trout like that one, the river merged the life of the spirit with the act of fly fishing, a legacy endlessly renewed by the passage of waters, home waters. John, you've left us with 
a really beautiful set of images and a reflection on family and fortitude and carrying on. And we um, will go off into this night with all sorts of lovely thoughts. We are really grateful for your time this evening and the places we've been able to travel with you. Uh, just a reminder to folks out there, if you enjoyed tonight, signed copies of John's book, Home Waters, can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge. Um, they have had a specially uh, set aside collection of signed books sent to them because truly the book was running out of stock. Um, thank you, Maureen Cole. Uh, again, use the coupon code AMINT20 as you order online and they'll waive the shipping fee for Media Mail. Don't miss this book for yourself or for your fishing or traveling buddy. A signed copy is something very special and a lovely addition to any library. We at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society are really delighted to have presented tonight's author talk. It was very special for us to do some fly fishing and to hear more about Montana. If you're researching your family, a person or a state like Montana, you might find our library and education center to be useful. Our stacks on Newbury Street are now open and NEHGS members can visit our digital archives anytime to do their research free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists about your research on your family. Um, some educational programs ahead on August 28, we're looking at German ancestry. In October, we'll research upstate New York. Later this year, we're focusing on Jewish emigration to America, Civil War history, and the basics of researching New England ancestry. You can attend many of these sessions at a discounted price if you're a member. Uh, this month for the next few days, new members can save $20 when they join. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and connect people. Um, free of charge, continuing on, um, our author talks in the American Inspiration Series. A week from tonight on September 2nd, we will welcome professors Sandra M. Gilbert and Susan Gubar with their new book, A Cultural History of the American Women's Experience Since 1947. Still Mad paints a portrait of the women's movement told through the lives and works of the past 60 years most celebrated women writers. Uh, this new book comes 40 years after the author's groundbreaking collect collaborative work, The Mad Woman in the Attic. Our co-presenters are the Boston Public Library, GBH Forum Network, and Porter Square Books. That same foursome is going to be gathered again for an event on September 23rd. We're welcoming Nathaniel Philbrick with his most recent work, Travels with George in Search of Washington and His Legacy. Part historical narrative, part travelogue, part reflection, the book grapples with Washington's legacy as a man of the people, a reluctant president, and a plantation and slave owner. My colleague Ryan Woods will moderate this conversation with Philbrook in two formats. Um, first, we'll have our standard free 6 p.m. virtual public book talk. Then for, the, for true fans of Bill Rick and George Washington, we're hosting a second add-on ticketed event at 7.30 featuring an extended Q&A with the author. For this session, Ryan will be joined by Catherine Algor, president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. These two moderators are gonna share your questions about Philbrick's process for researching, writing, and interpreting history. This second event comes with a signed copy of the book, which also can be personalized to your name or to a friend's or to a favorite teacher's or to whomever you want. Um, don't miss these two happenings featuring Nathaniel Philbrick on September 23rd. And now back to tonight, um, truly winding down, John and Alan, we thank you for this great evening, this escape to Montana, to a place and to a sport so many of us love, and to our audience uh, from the Connecticut River Conservancy, from Trout Unlimited and elsewhere. Lots of you are turning in for the first time. We are really grateful for your interest, your support and your questions. From all of us behind the scenes across the United States, north and south. We wish you a good evening and a great summer ahead in its final days on the river. Happy fishing to all and a good night.